Now turn to part one. Part one. Renting an apartment. You will hear two men talking about renting an apartment with a third man. Hi, good afternoon. Hi, welcome to the Carlton Hotel. How can I help you? We've just driven up from London and we're going to stay here in York for a few days. We'd like to book a couple of rooms. OK, sir. So for how many nights is that? We'll be leaving on Monday morning, so let me see. That's three nights. And you said two rooms. Who are the rooms for? I'm here with my wife and two kids. They are nine and eleven. Sorry, nine and twelve. The eldest has just had his birthday. So we'd like one twin room for the kids and another double for my wife and I. OK, well, we've got two rooms available, both en suite. Great. How much are they per night? Let me see. The twin room is £40 per night and the double room is £50 per night. OK, that sounds reasonable. So what is the total for three nights for both rooms? Let me check. That will be a total of £270. And that includes everything? Yes, that price includes tax. OK. Can I pay by credit card? Yes, sure. You'll need to pay for the first night now, and you can pay for the other nights when you leave. Or you can pay for all three nights now. I think I'll just pay for everything now, as we'll definitely be here till Monday. OK, that's fine. I'll just need to take some details from you to confirm the booking. Can you give me your full name? Yes, it's Michael Fernsby. That's F-E-R-N-S-B-Y. And what's your date of birth, please? The 15th of October, 1968. The 5th of October, 1968? No, the 15th. Oh, OK, sorry. And can you give me your address? Sure, it's 273 Stanton Court. That's S-T-A-N-T-O-N. -T London WC2D5JB. WC2D5JB? Yes, that's right. And your telephone number? My mobile number is... Hold on, just let me check. I can never remember it. Ah, here it is. It's 08773 879 456. OK, those rooms are booked for you then. OK. I know we're a bit out of town here. Can you give me some information about getting into the centre of town? We'll probably head in tomorrow. Well, you could drive in, but the parking is not great in town. It's difficult to get a space and is quite expensive if you're staying there all day. Yes, we're thinking of going to look around some of the shops and to look at the wall around the city. So we'll probably be there most of the day. In that case, you're probably best taking a taxi or the bus. How much is a taxi? Into town it will be about £12. Actually, no, I'd say it's around £15. Fares have increased recently. Uh, we can book it here for you and it will pick you up outside. It only takes about ten minutes. Right, I see. What about the bus? How much is that and where does it go from? It's only £2 per person. It's not far from here. You go out of here, turn right onto Oak Tree Avenue and it's about a five-minute walk down the road. You can't miss it. The bus ride is about 15 minutes. Oh, OK. Maybe we could do that. Or you could walk, actually, if you like walking. Part of the way you can walk through the nice park, which is fairly popular with visitors to York. It's about 30 minutes, but it's quite pleasant. Right, well, there's a few options there. We'll have a think about it. I'll go and get my wife and kids. They're just waiting in the car. OK, no problem. Thanks for booking with us.
That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a woman talking to a group of students about volunteering opportunities with her company, Time Abroad. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen to questions 11 to 14. OK, everyone. Thanks for coming today and for your interest in volunteering abroad. For those that don't know much about our company, Time Abroad, let me start by telling you a bit more. Time Abroad is one of the largest volunteer abroad organisations in the UK. The company was founded in 2000. In 2007, the company grew by joining with another company, PT Travel making us even larger. In 2014, we sent 10,000 people abroad on a variety of service projects and internships overseas, more than any other company. All participants receive the best support from our full-time professional staff to ensure that the experience is safe, worthwhile and fun. We have lots of very experienced staff working for us. We have around 150 full-time staff members many of whom are former volunteers themselves, inspired by their own experience. Some of these people are even part of the original groups of volunteers back in the early 90s. About 75 of those staff are not located in the UK at all and spend their whole time in another country supporting the volunteers. They are experts on the local communities you are working in, having spent their whole lives there. They have vast experience in fields such as community development or education. The times that volunteers join the programme vary a lot. Some join in July because they have just finished studying at college or university and want to do some volunteering before they move on to work or further study. The winter months are also popular because people want to escape the cold weather in the UK. But there are no set start dates and programmes run continuously throughout the year, so the majority of volunteers start when it is best for them. Time Abroad is an entirely independent organisation which does not receive any funding from religious bodies, political parties, development organisations or other sources. And of course, we don't request money from our partner organisations in the developing world. All our work is 100% funded through your contributions as a volunteer. We do get help from the government, but that is from reduced business taxes, not financial contributions. It is this financial independence that gives us the freedom to set up projects wherever we think it may be useful and where we think that our volunteers can make a valuable contribution. Before you listen to the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen to questions 15 to 20. Now I'm going to tell you about some of the more popular opportunities in a bit more detail. One of the most popular volunteering choices is teaching. You'll find a warm welcome awaits you from our students around the world. The main thing you will do is assisting with English conversation, because although the local teachers are very capable of teaching the structural aspects of the English language, such as the grammar, they do not use the correct intonation or pronunciation, because they lack the confidence of a native speaker. By providing conversational English teaching, you can greatly enhance the learning experience of thousands of children and adults with whom we work in the developing world. 
You can also volunteer in agriculture and farming. Access to safe and healthy food is a major concern of any society. Volunteers work on a farm with the aim of promoting sustainable local food sources and responsible farming. Using pesticides and other destructive agricultural techniques can have a long-term negative impact on the environment and threaten the future well-being of whole regions. Time Abroad's agricultural and farming projects focus on organic farming practices and educating local communities on their benefits. You could also volunteer in the field of veterinary medicine. If you do this, you will be working alongside a vet in a local veterinary practice. You will help the vet when people bring in sick animals or join the vet on visits to people's houses or other places. You will gain fantastic insight that would not be possible in your own country. You are likely to see many exciting types of animals, like snakes, big cats or even elephants. And you will develop a better understanding of the problems people are faced with in both urban and rural areas of the third world. So, I hope that's helped you to learn a bit more about time abroad. Does anybody have any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a woman inquiring about a media studies programme. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. I'm looking for some advice about doing a master's degree in media studies. Am I at the right place? Yes, my name's Mark. I'm head of the media studies course. Nice to meet you. And you are? I'm Louise. Nice to meet you too. So how can I help you? Well, I've seen the prospectus for the course, but I'm still a bit confused about a few things and about some of the options for studying. What's your situation at the moment? Are you working? Yes. I've been working as a journalist for a local newspaper for the last three months. Prior to that, I had two jobs in the media, at a small local radio station for about two years and at a TV station for about four years. So I've worked in media for about six years in total. OK, well, that's useful if you want to do the course. What's your motivation to do further study? I enjoy my job a lot at the moment, but I feel the opportunities for promotion are quite limited. It's not that I think a master's will help with this, though. I'll probably leave my job, maybe to go into TV or something. But basically, I think wherever I end up going in the future, employers prefer to see someone with postgraduate qualifications these days. And are you intending to study full-time? Well, I'd really like to keep working, as I need an income. What are the options for me if I want to work while studying? You could do certain modules over a number of years, if you like. It's up to you how many you do. Basically, you get credits for the ones that you complete. People usually do the Masters in anything from 18 months up until four years. It depends on your time. If you wanted a fixed schedule and attendance and did it part-time, then that would be a total of three years. So what's the admission criteria to join the course? Well, there are a few things that are useful but not essential. But there are some requirements. Usually, to join a Masters, people must have a bachelor's degree. But we are prepared to overlook this if someone has enough work experience. But you must have one or the other. It's useful if you have research experience, as you have to complete a thesis, but we can train you on this if not. It is essential that you have motivation if you want to join the course, as it is very demanding. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. What about the cost?
costs for the course. The fees for a year, if you are studying part time, are two thousand two hundred and fifty pounds. No, sorry, they've gone up this year, two thousand four hundred pounds. Of course, you are paying for all other living costs. Is there any kind of bursary or scholarship available to help with the fees? Yes, there are things available, but you have to meet the criteria to get funding. Often, though, the university will actually contact you about funding. Universities have a certain budget available to provide funds, so they will look for the best students and offer them something if they think they will be suitable. You would have to have a firm offer in place to join the course, though, before you'd be considered for any funding. Where can I go to find out more about it? The best place to look for information about funding is on our university website. All the details about whether you're eligible, what help is on offer, and how to apply will be there. If you can't find the information you're looking for, you can always come and speak to us again, and there will be a number you can ring. OK, thanks for that. And is it easy to get hold of you if I need to speak to you further? Yes, I'm here most days, but you can always phone the office first to check. It's best to book an appointment in case I'm not around. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You are going to hear a lecture about the history of Indian Railways. First, you now have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In today's lecture, we're going to be talking about the history of Indian Railways, from when they began up until 1945, when they had all been taken over by the government. Indian Railways is an Indian state-owned enterprise, owned and operated by the government of India through the Ministry of Railways. It is one of the world's largest railway networks, comprising 115,000 kilometers of track, over a route of 65,000 kilometers, and there are 7,500 stations. It transports over 25 million passengers daily, which is over 9 billion on an annual basis. Indian Railways is the world's ninth largest commercial or utility employer by number of employees, with over 1.4 million employees. The history of rail transport in India began in the mid-19th century. The core of the pressure for building railways in India came from London. In 1848, there was not a single kilometer of railway line in India. A British engineer, Robert Maitland Brereton, was responsible for the expansion of the railways from 1857 onwards. The Allahabad Jabalpur branch line of the East Indian Railway had been opened in June 1867. Brereton was responsible for linking this with the Great Indian Peninsula Railway, resulting in a combined network of 6,400 kilometers. Hence, it became possible to travel directly from Bombay to Calcutta. This route was officially opened on the 7th of March in 1870, and it was part of the inspiration for French writer Jules Verne's book, Around the World in 80 Days. At the opening ceremony, the Viceroy Lord Mayo concluded that if possible, at the earliest possible moment, the whole country should be covered with a network of lines in a uniform system. By 1875, about 95 million pounds were invested by British companies in Indian railways. By 1880, the network had a route mileage of about 14,500 kilometers, mostly radiating inwards from the three major port cities of Bombay, Madras, and Calcutta. By 1895, India had started building its own locomotives, and in 1896 sent engineers and locomotives to help build the Uganda Railways. In 1900, the Great Indian Peninsula Railway became a government-owned company. The network spread to the modern-day states of Assam, Rajasthan, and Andhra Pradesh, and soon, various autonomous kingdoms began to have their own rail systems. In 1905, an early railway board was constituted, but the powers were formally vested under Lord Curzon, the then Viceroy of India. It served under the Department of Commerce and Industry and had a government railway official serving as chairman, a railway manager from England, and an agent of one of the company railways as the other two members. 
For the first time in its history, the railways began to make a profit. In 1907, almost all the rail companies were taken over by the government. The following year, the first electric locomotive made its appearance, and with the arrival of World War I, the railways were used to meet the needs of the British outside India, but with the end of the war, the railways were in a state of disrepair and collapse. In 1920, with the network having expanded to 61,220 kilometers, a need for central management was mooted by Sir William Ackworth, a British railway economist. Based on the East India Railway Committee chaired by Ackworth, the government took over the management of the railways and detached the finances of the railways from the other government revenues. The period between 1920 and 1929 was a period of economic boom. There were 66,000 kilometer of railway lines serving the country, the railways represented a capital value of some 687 million sterling, and they carried over 620 million passengers and approximately 90 million tons of goods each year. Following the Great Depression, the railways suffered economically for the next eight years, and the Second World War severely crippled the railways. Starting in 1939, about 40% of the rolling stock, including locomotives and coaches, was taken to the Middle East. The railway workshops were converted to ammunitions workshops, and many railway tracks were dismantled to help the Allies in the war. By 1946, all rail systems had been taken over by the government. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. The IELTS writing pattern for a Band 9 essay is characterized by the following task response. The essay fully addresses all parts of the task and presents a fully developed position with relevant, fully extended, and well-supported ideas. Coherence and cohesion. The essay is well organized and easy to follow, with clear and logical connections between ideas. The writer uses a variety of cohesive devices effectively but not excessively. Lexical resource, the writer uses a wide range of vocabulary accurately and appropriately, with sophisticated control of lexical features. Grammatical range and accuracy, the writer uses a wide range of grammatical structures accurately and fluently, with only minor errors. In addition to the above, a band 9 essay will typically be engaging and interesting to read. The writer uses a variety of techniques to capture the reader's attention, such as vivid imagery, rhetorical devices, and storytelling. Original and thought-provoking, the writer demonstrates critical thinking skills and provides their own unique perspective on the topic. Well proofread and free of errors, the essay is free of grammatical, spelling, and punctuation errors. Here are some specific tips for writing a Band 9 IELTS essay. Plan your essay carefully. Take some time to think about your main points and how you will organize them. This will help you to write a coherent and well-structured essay. Use a variety of sentence structures. Avoid writing in simple, monotonous sentences. Instead, Use a variety of sentence structures to make your writing more interesting and engaging. Use appropriate vocabulary. The IELTS examiners are looking for students who can use a wide range of vocabulary accurately and appropriately. Choose your words carefully and avoid using the same words over and over again. Proofread your essay.